Now, Daniel chapter number 8, let's take just a few minutes and go back. And uh, in verse, uh, well, let's, let's look at verse uh, uh, 12 at, to begin. Uh, maybe we should go back to 11. Uh, he's talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a king, and he came against the people of God. He had a, a real bad attitude toward Jewish people. He hated them. And in so doing, he tried to destroy them. He destroyed their temple. Uh, and what he did, he took the altar out, or the holy place. He actually entered into the holy place himself, uh, the most holy place. He tore it out. He actually offered a pig upon the altar as a sacrifice which was desecrating to the Jewish people because they were commanded in the law of Moses not to eat pork, not to have anything to do with pork. If you recall in the New Testament, when Jesus went over to the country of the Gadarenes, uh, they, he found a, a man over there. Of course, he knew where the man was, being Jesus, but the man was demon-possessed, and when he cast the demons out of that man, there was a herd of swine there in that region, those demons went into those swine and they ran down a cliff into the Sea of Galilee and I've often said they committed suicide. All right? Because we always say you can't say suey to a hog. <laughs> you remember that one? So they committed suicide in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and the people there, when this all happened, they said, Jesus, we don't want you over here. You, you know, get away. And the reason being, of course, they were not supposed to have pigs to start with. They were in violation of the law of Moses if they were Jewish people. Now, some commentators say that there, there was groups of Gentiles there as well, and possibly so, a mixed group maybe. But anyway, the Jewish people were not supposed to eat pork, and they weren't supposed to have anything to do with, with pigs because a pig is an unclean animal. What was the status of, or the difference between clean and unclean? Uh, the clean animal had to what? Anybody know? Chew the cud and cloven hoof. Pigs don't do that. They have a cloven hoof, but they don't chew the cud. And so they're pronounced as unclean. That's why the, the, the law of Moses told them not to have anything to do with pigs. So this Antiochus and Epiphanes uh, did the opposite of what he should have done with the altar, he should have never done that, but he wanted to desecrate the holy things of God. He was not just a Jew hater, he was a God hater. And so he did a lot of damage, of course. He, his attitude toward the Jewish people was that he tried to convert them to his Greek culture, Greek language, and Greek gods and goddesses, but it didn't work because they, they, didn't, uh, they just didn't listen very well to him. And they were stubborn in the fact that they knew that the law said they weren't to worship idol gods. So uh, when his attitude did not work upon these people, and I think I, I had it on the board, but I erased it. Uh, he waged a war against Jerusalem. He killed and slaughtered 40,000 Jewish people within a few days and took 10,000 into uh, slavery back into his quarters to make slaves of them. And uh, uh, he, he assaulted the Jews. It didn't work, so he begins attacks. And the first thing he did was attack their scriptures. Uh, I'm going to give you five things on his attack against them. If you, I don't think I've given this to you before. But uh, the first thing he did was attack the Torah, the, the Old Testament, five books of Moses and the prophets, the law and the prophets. He tried his best to destroy that. But the Jewish people so reverenced the Word of God and they were so diligent in hiding the Word of God and in recopying the Word of God. Keep in mind that the Word of God has always had to be copied manually. And at that time, of course, on, man, on, on parchments and other types of manuscripts, and they had people who did that on a daily basis of recopying the Scriptures over and over and over. And they were so uh, in reverence 
reverence and really fear of the Lord God Jehovah that when they would come to a place in the, in the writings where that God's name was, they would go and change their garments. They would take a bath and put on a new garment. You know, the name of God was never uttered aloud by the Jewish people. And even today, the Orthodox Jews still observe that practice. They do not speak aloud the name of God because it is so holy and they have such reverence. Two times a year, they whisper the name of God aloud. That's on the Day of Atonement, and they whisper His name. They don't even know if they're pronouncing the name of Jehovah properly, Yahweh. That's the closest we can come to it. Uh, they don't even know if that is the correct pronunciation of the name of God. And rather than blaspheme His name and desecrate His name, they just don't use His name. If you've got, so I guess you've got some Jewish writings in English maybe, if you ever read a book that's translated into English, when you come to God, here's what they'll do. They'll, they, won't, they won't write it out. They put a G dash D. They will not write the name of God out in writing in English. That's, my Jewish books all are like that because they reverence His name. His name is so high and so holy. I would that we who are Christian people had such reverence for the things of God, but we don't. Uh, our kids, you know, little, little kids, I mean, you hear them using words they should have never have heard anybody use before because we, we're losing our reverence and our reverential fear of God. But he attacked the scriptures. The second thing he attacked was their sacrificial system. He attacked their sacrifices. God had ordained what they could do and what they should do and when they should do it and what animals to bring and what purpose they were sacrificed for. And every animal sacrifice, and if you go to the book of Leviticus, you'll see there are five offerings that were given and they all point forward to the Lord Jesus Christ as well as the tabernacle and the temple services. Everything in the Old Testament is looking forward to the cross where that Jesus, our ultimate sacrifice, would come and bleed and die and pay the debt for sin. So he attacked their sacrificial system. See, in his way of thinking, there was no such person as Jehovah God. Uh, his God was Zeus, Z-E-U-S, -E Zeus the Greek God that was supposed to be the replacement for the Lord God, Jehovah, the great I Am. So in his way of thinking, the sacrifice that he brought of a pig was okay because uh, Zeus was the God that he worshipped. Now the third thing that he attacked was the sanctuary. And in these verses, the, when, when Daniel here, he hears one saint speaking to another saint. Now that's in verse number 13. The word saint there... If you're making notes, I don't know. Did I bring this stuff out two weeks ago or not? Okay, I'm trying to find out where I've been and where I'm going. <laughs> That's bad, isn't it? Uh, all, you all don't need this anymore, do you? Good. I don't need it either. But uh, Daniel heard a saint, S-A-I-N-T, and he was speaking to a second saint here. Now, the word saint means holy one. In the context of the scripture, he is in vision form. He's having a vision. This is not a human person that he is hearing. These are angelic beings in this vision. He sees these, this word saint. It's unnamed. I looked it up in the Hebrew to see if there was any indication that this was a human being with a name. It's not. These are angelic beings in his vision that he hears conversing. And here's what they're saying. They're saying to one another, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? Now, they're interested in how long it's going to last and how long it's going to end. And so, these, so the sanctuary is one thing that Antiphicus and Antiochus, rather, and Epiphanes... That's his second name. He gave that name to himself, by the way, because that's the name meaning he's, he's a god. 
that, that connected him to the gods. And so uh, they're wanting to know how long it's going to be till all this is going to be erectified and taken care of. And then not only that, he attacked the J Jewish people, which are the saints. Now, I said I was going to give you five things. I misspoke there. I should have said four things because that's all I've got in my notes. But th his attack was horrible. Uh, he, he, uh, he was a very ruthless person. Uh, he was ruler of Syria from 175 to 163 B.C. And so when he took over Jerusalem, offering this pig, and by the way, that happened on December the 14th in the year 168 B.C., but then in the year 165 B.C. on December the 14th, which was three years later, Jerusalem was finally delivered by a man by the name of Judas Maccabees. Now, how many has got an old, old Bible that has the Apocrypha in it? Does anybody have one? There are 14 books of the Apocrypha that in the beginning, when the canon of the Bible was trying to be determined, remember, listen, unless you've studied all this, you don't understand what the Bible has gone through for us to be able to have what we have. Throughout the centuries of time, people had to decide Holy Spirit. And there are several books that at one time were added in the old Bibles. I have a copy of an old Bible. In fact, some friends of mine many years ago on my birthday found this old Bible in, a, in an antique store, and they bought it and cleaned it up, and they brought it to my house and gave it to me as a birthday gift because they know I like Bibles, and I have lots of Bibles. I collect Bibles. I've got Bibles that are little bitty Bibles about this big, and you can barely read the print. I've got little song books like that. They just sang them. There was no music written to them, so they just sang whatever tunes they wanted to to them. Anybody ever see any of those little song books? The old primitive Baptist churches used to use them. So you know I'm talking. I've got some that were used over in Scott County, Virginia, in primitive Baptist churches. Huh? Big cut is one of them. I've heard of big cut. And they had it. And back in the old uh, regular Baptist churches, which there's very few of those left, there's one here in Bloomingdale. And they meet once a month at that church. And then the next week they go to another regular Baptist church. They have services every Sunday, but they go around to all these churches and they're called regular Baptists. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Another name for them is hard shell Baptist. And so they did not use musical instruments in their churches. So several people here know I'm, what I'm talking about. You've got roots, I guess, in, in those churches. And so they would have a man. I attended one of their funerals one time of a lady uh, in my church that our pastor's mother passed away. And we drove to Castlewood, Virginia for her funeral service. And so when they started the funeral, and they had five preachers, and the goal was to get her buried before sundown. Uh, because it's against the law to bury anybody after sundown. Did you all realize that? So uh, this man started singing, and I punched my wife, and I said, it'll take him two hours to sing because they don't use music, and they, they repeat. He, what he does, he sings a line. It's, it's called lining a song, and then they sing that line, and then they keep on. You ought to hear him sing Amazing Grace, and they sing in minor keys, they don't sing in the major keys. They sing in the minor keys. And um, it took them forever to get through their songs. I mean, um, I told Jeannie, I said, now's a good time to take a nap. But anyway, I, and I'm not being ugly. It, to me, it was very interesting because I had never been in, a, in one of their funeral services like that. I had been in a church service, and, and the first words he said, he said, now just bear with us. We sing differently than most people do, so bear with us. Uh, just bear with us, he said, and, and we did bear with him, okay? But uh, it's funny, you know. But anyway, I've got an old Bible that was given to me, and it's got the 14 books of the Apocrypha. One of them, Maccabees 1 and Maccabees 2, and it gives the history of Judas Maccabees when he delivered Jerusalem from, from Antiochus Epiphanes in 165 B.C. Very interesting to read. Now, at some point in the history of the canonization of books, those 14 have been left out of our Bible because uh, the church fathers decided for various reasons, which we're not going into today, 
that they were not really inspired writings of the Holy Spirit. Holy men of old, the Bible says holy men of old were moved on by the Holy Spirit. And I think we have what we need today. We have the complete revelation of God, which is the final authority on anything. I believe God's word before I do anything else because I know God's word is true and it's preserved for us today in the form that we have. And so I'm not concerned about all this stuff. I like to read about the history of the Bible, how it came about, how it was put together. And there are other books. I have a book called the Book of Enoch. Do you, have you heard of that one, Sue? I'm sure you have if you've studied any prophecy. It's not an inspired book, but it's very interesting to read about the lifestyle and what happened before the flood. And it was written, in fact, there's three of those Enoch books, one, two, and three. And um, other books, there's the book of Judith, there's the book, you know, Edras, E-D-R-A-S, one and two. There's, there's many books that are not found in our Bible, but they give history of Jews, the history of Jewish people. They're interesting to read about, but they're not necessarily the word of God, per se, as we know the Bible to be. So this, and... and uh, Tychus Epiphanes uh, was actually dealt with, and of course God dealt with him, and that's the most important thing. So in verses 13 and 14, Daniel is overhearing these two holy ones. I'm, I believe they're angelic beings, and, and uh, they could probably only be understood as angels in a vision. And uh, they're inquiring about this daily sacrifice and uh, when will the temple or the sanctuary be cleansed or purified? And the answer was, and this is where we're getting into time now, uh, the answer was, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to erase this from the board, and you tell me, let me find my, my marker here. I've left it laying on the pulpit. But the answer was how many days somebody can... 2,300 days. Now... This brings us to Jewish time. This 2,300 days sets a time limit on something happening. This is the first time in the Bible, or in the book of Daniel, I should say, that you find days mentioned, and days in your Bible are 24-hour days, okay? When the Bible says that God made the heaven and the earth, and, and in the first chapters, chapters 1 through 3 of Genesis, he gives us six days of creation, God created all things in six days and rested on the seventh. Now, there are theologians who believe that each day represents thousands of years, that it took God thousands of years to speak this stuff into existence. I don't believe that. You say, why? Because I believe, well, here's the Hebrew word for day. You know what it means in the Hebrew? Twenty-four hour time period. It means when you're reading your Bible in Genesis one and three, it said evening and morning were the first day, evening and morning were the second day, evening and morning the third day. The Jewish time is not like ours. Our time goes from twelve to twelve. Okay, Jewish time doesn't do that. Somebody tell me what it is. I've told you this before, I think. But if you don't remember, I'm not going to hold it against you. Huh? No, why, what? Evening and morning. Jewish time starts at p.m. And then, of course, keep going around the clock like that to make a 24 hour time period. Now, that's what Sabbath days. You know, we got a lot of people trying to keep the Sabbath and stuff today. Well, Sabbath actually starts on Friday evening at 6 p.m. Or more technically, at sunset. Sunset is at a different time every day. But they wait for the sun to set to start the Sabbath. You say, well, how did they know? Well, in the, in the days of Jesus Christ and the days before Jesus Christ, there would be a priest that would get on top of the mountain and blow a trumpet, a ram's horn. And that ram's horn could be heard all over Jerusalem. And this, this comes from a great book that I have on the temple, temple services, by a Jewish man who was converted to Christianity and became an Anglican pastor in England. His name is Alfred Edersheim. 
I have his, all of his works, his work on Jesus Christ, the life and times of Jesus the Messiah is a book about this thick, and it's one of my cherished possessions. It is awesome. I constantly refer to that over and over because you learn so much about the history. You learn so much about the customs, why Jesus said what he did at certain times, why he was where he was at certain times. You learn so much about the, their, their lifestyle. It is amazing. His book on the temple is one of the best that you will ever find on the temple. And he goes into the temple worship and services, gives you a detailed account of every move the priest made, when they did it, what they said, the prayers they prayed over the sacrifices. It's all in these books. You say, now, I know the average person doesn't study this, and I know that, and I understand that. And the reason I have been a student of the Word of God like I have, and I'm not trying to say I'm a great student, I am in the learning process. I feel like I've just got out of kindergarten. Because you know why? The more you find there is in Jesus, the more you find there is to know about Jesus and to know him. And I tell you, if, if in my lifetime, if I can just scratch the surface a little bit, it'll be great when I see him one day. Because I'm going to see him. I'm going to see Jesus. I, they say, well, what if you don't make it? Well, his word's not true. If we don't make it as believers, his word's not true. He said, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When I was a little eight-year-old boy, my dad led me into a prayer of salvation from John chapter 1. He said, as many as received him to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even in them that believe on his name. And that moment down in the sawdust in that tent revival, I knelt there and I became a child of the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you, I just, I rejoice in the fact, and I know I'm saved. I mean, I have no doubt. I'm going to heaven. I have gotten my whole family together when we have family outings, and I tell them, one of these days, Daddy's going to be gone. If Jesus doesn't soon come, I'm getting closer to death all the time. And I'm getting closer to the rapture all the time, too, in time. But I said, I, I don't want you having one bit of doubt when you look down upon my cold, dead form I'm not there. That's just the house I lived in. I'm going to be with Jesus. I'm going to be in glory. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I know people doubt. I understand that. And I, and I want to help people that need assurance. Listen, there was a time in my life when I was a young man, I went through a spell where I, I needed assurance. The, the more removed I got from my eight-year-old profession of faith, the more I questioned, was it genuine? Was it real? Did I really know what I was doing? And you know, I would go to the altar and i say, Lord, I, I want to know for sure that I'm saved. And you know how you can know is get into the Word of God. Right here is the basis. See, your profession is not the basis of your salvation. It's who you believed on. It's who you trusted in. It's who you committed your life to. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ that determines whether you're saved or not, not your profession of faith. It's not even the prayer you prayed. You don't get saved by praying. You get saved by believing, Acts 16 and 31. And they said when, when Paul and Silas got in the Philippi jail after they'd been beaten and, and uh, they were in the inner cell and they were in stocks and one of them said to the other about midnight, said, let's sing a song. Let's, let's do some praise and worship here while we're in the jail. Listen, in order for you to be able to sing your song of praise at midnight, you've got to learn it before you get in jail. Are you with me? Did you get that point? You've got to be involved in praise and worship long before you get to the jail time. Or you don't know the song. You don't just learn it at midnight. You learn it through your experiences that led you to where you got in jail. And so one of them said, let's, let's sing. The, other, they, the Bible said they sang and they prayed at midnight and the, the prisoners heard them. Is the Bible, that's what it says, the prisoners heard them. And as they were singing and praying, the bonds were loosed. The jail, God sent an earthquake and the jail doors sprang open and not one prisoner left. They were captivated by what they had heard from the lips of those two men of God who were anointed of the Holy Spirit singing and praying 
and the jailer sprang in. He called for a light. He sprang in. The reason why he was so interested in getting saved, his life was at stake. If one prisoner had gotten loose, they would have taken his head off. That's what the Jewish law and even the Roman law stated. But listen, he sprang in and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they didn't say, you need to go join a church somewhere. You need to get baptized. You need to do this. You need to do that. You need to count the rosary beads. You need to, uh, listen, they didn't, you know his plan of salvation. You know what, and it's great that they could agree on it. You got two people in agreement. The devil did a bad thing when he put two Holy Ghost filled men in the same cell. He did a bad move when that happened. He didn't realize what was going to take place when you get two together in agreement. Jesus said, if two or three gather in my name, I'm in the midst. You know what I tell the people at church? I don't know which seat he's sitting on, but he's here today. He's here. This one lady, I don't know, you were there other Sunday, and she said, he's sitting right beside of me, didn't she? She said, he's sitting right. I said, oh, he's up here in the pulpit with me. We had a little fun time right there. It's different people saying, oh, he's back here on this seat with me. No, he's over here. He's everywhere. That's where he's at. But he's, listen, he's here this morning. He is. He's, you know, so how do I know he's here? Well, he lives inside of us. He's, he's our blessed hope for the future. But anyway, they got together. They got to, and that jailer, and here's what they said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So it's not your prayer. It's not the fact that whoever it was that led you to the Lord, that, that's not the issue. The issue, did you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you receive him as a, the gift of eternal life? Romans 3 and 23 says all have sinned. Romans 6 23 said that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you know, there's a lot of people that make professions when they're kids like I did. And I was truly convicted of the Holy Spirit. I know that. But as I got more removed from that, and, and teenage years are rough sometimes, going from adolescent to becoming an adult is a hard experience for a teenager. Don't be mad at teenagers because they get sort of cocky and, uh, you know, they sassy and all that stuff. Um, back when I was young, they called it a generation gap. But you know what? My mother had the, she had the solution for that gap. She would get my dad's belt and it brought the gap together. I'm telling you, it did. She used my dad's gap. Listen, it brought it all together. It did. She didn't allow us to talk back. And if we did, well, a lot of times we got our jaws boxed. That's why my face goes inward like this. Have you ever wondered about that? <laughs> my cheeks don't expand. They go, they go inward right in here. One time she was making biscuits, and my mother had this habit. She didn't use Now, when I make biscuits, I don't, I don't like the doughy part. So I've got a big spoon I stir with and, and get my dough together, sprinkle it up good with flour, and then put that little ball of dough out here on some flour and so on, start rolling it out. My mother didn't do that. Listen, she, she put her dough in there, her, her shortening, her buttermilk, then she took her bare hands and she got in there and she worked that stuff. And one day she was making biscuits there and she always poured her stuff up there on a thing there on the cabinet and I came through and she said something to me and I sassed her and I had a doughy handprint on my face. <laughs> I'm not lying to you. Half of that dough was scraped off my face and... <laughs> Yeah, it's good I didn't have a beard. I don't know. What, I was just young. I was a teenager. I know that. I don't know how old I was, 14, 15 years old. But listen, she didn't hold back. My mother, she was a wonderful lady, don't get me wrong, but I don't know where she got that habit. <laughs> I guess her parents maybe, I don't know. But anyway, let's get back to what we're saying. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is what causes us to get born again. Amen. I'm just glad I'm saved today. I really am. I'm happy that I know the Lord. Every day with Jesus is getting better all the time. Praise the Lord. It's getting tweeter and tweeter, and it'll finally turn to tugger. How about that? You want me to analyze that for you? Sweeter and sweeter finally turn to sugar. It gets tweeter and tweeter and finally turn to tugger. All right. But let's get back to... to and the sacrifice here. And so uh, he, he, uh, he says there's going to be a time set, a time limit, a limit of time. We're talking about the 24-hour days, the yom, the 24-hour days. So here he says it's going to be 2,300 years. 
Now, this is according to the vision that he saw, and this is God's word, of course. And then let's go on down. And he said, uh, verse 14, he said, uh, 2,300 days shall be the sanctuary be cleansed or purified. That's what, it, that's what it actually means is cleansed or purified or sanctified. And so in verse 15, it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision, sought for the meaning. Then behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. Now, this is known in, in the, and I've told you this before about theophanies. Have you, you all remember me talking about theophanies? T-H-E-O, uh, theopho, P-A-T-H-Y. It's, they're also called Christophanies. The reason why being is because it's a pre-Bethlehemic appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you say, well, how could Jesus appear before Bethlehem? Because he's God. He's always been. At Bethlehem, he just took on the human form. Uh, Jesus has always been from eternity past. God the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, the triune Godhead incorporated into one. He said, I and my Father are one. Now, so this is Jesus, and he hears a man's voice between the banks of Eulalai, which called and said, Gabriel, this is Jesus telling Gabriel to make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell up on my face. Now, when, when people in the Bible saw angelic beings, and many times they appeared as human beings, uh, these angels didn't always appear. Well, they couldn't have appeared in spirit form because natural eyes can't see spirit beings. Unless God allows you to see in a different dimension, you can't see an angel in, a, in his spirit form. Now, in the Bible, they appear as, as men many times. In the life of Abraham, when he saw there was three men came to his tent door, two of them were angels and one was Jesus Christ. Because when they, when they went on down to Sodom, there was only two men that went to Sodom. The third one released himself, and that was Jesus, of course. So in the Old Testament days before Bethlehem, when Jesus wanted to appear, appear to somebody, he appeared many times as an angel or as a human being, but they didn't know until God showed them, and I'm trying to put this where we can understand it. Uh, these things are miraculous, therefore we have a lot of problem comprehending the miraculous many times. Uh, if I was to tell you today that I saw an angel, you probably wouldn't believe it. That's, but see, back in those days, they did not, the individual people did not have copies of the Word of God. The Word of God was being copied over and over and over and over, and they didn't go down to the local Walmart in the, in the book section and buy a copy of the Bible. You couldn't do things like that, see? So God had to, God had to reveal Himself in more ways than just the written Word, which He did. He revealed himself in visions and dreams and signs and wonders and angelic forms and so on and so forth. So before the birth of Jesus at Bethlehem, when he showed himself, it's called in the Old Testament as theophanies. The word theo, this is God right here. This is the appearance of God. It's what this is. By the way, another good example is Jacob when he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. When you see a theophany or Christophany in the Old Testament, lots of times it is identified in your English Bible as the angel of the Lord. And the word Lord is Jehovah. And it's going to be in all caps in most of your study Bibles. If, anytime you see the word Lord in your Old Testament, this is a cue. You can, you can get this. It, when you find that, that is the word Jehovah or Yahweh. I didn't plan on teaching all this today because, but I don't care what we teach as long as we're in the Word of God. And you need to know this. This is going to go along with the book of Daniel to help you with all this. And it's important. And uh, so uh, Daniel in this vision has Gabriel to come to him. Jesus is telling Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So when he when he appears, Daniel is so frightened and afraid because he's in the presence of pure holiness. I want you to get this. And in the Bible, when people saw appearances of angels and even Jesus himself before uh, Bethlehem, uh, they fell on their faces. They worshipped. 
they were humbled by that appearance. Um, they weren't, listen, they weren't elated to the point where they went out among the people and bragged about it. Uh, years ago, there was a very well-known preacher that said that he's, he saw Jesus, that Jesus appeared to him, and he said Jesus was 900 feet tall. I don't know if you remember that. I, I remember it. And uh, I'm not going to call names or anything. I'm not here to bash preachers or anything like that. I don't do that. And, uh, but I know this, that Jesus does not and never appeared in Bible times as a 900 foot tall being. Jesus is a man and he appears as a man even before Bethlehem. And so uh, he, he uh, now as he was speaking with me, verse 18, Daniel is in a deep sleep on his face toward the ground. Now I want you to get this. He said in verse 17, I was afraid and fell upon my face. Verse 18, he was asleep. In other words, he was out of it. Physically, he was asleep, but mentally and emotionally, he was aware of what was going on. Okay, but he, he said he was in a deep sleep. And then the angel touched him, Gabriel touched him, and he sat upright, and he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last time of the indignation, for at the time appointed the end shall be. Now here again, we're getting into time element, and he is telling us and telling Daniel that there's going to be an appointed time for the end. Now why did he say that to Daniel? They were in Babylonian captivity. Okay? Daniel at that time was an old man. He had been there for many years since he was a teenager. And most theologians all agree he was in his 80s. He was probably mid-80, 85 years old at this time. He had been in Babylon all these years. His people had been there. Children had been raised up there. Grandchildren had come and been raised up there. And, but he's telling Daniel, and for Daniel to prophesy to other people as well, there will come an end to all of this. God has showed this to me to give them hope, to give them assurance that they won't always be there. Now, when, when I read this, here, here's one thing we need to understand about prophecy, and let me give you this. A prophetic word that you find in the Bible, first, it's, called, it's got a primary purpose, a primary application. Now, I learned this years ago in Bible college that every prophetic word has a twofold prophetic meaning, a primary reason and then a secondary reason. What was the primary reason? I just explained it to you. A first meaning. Now, every prophecy is not always fulfilled completely at that given moment. I see you're writing notes. I'm trying to be slow. I usually talk real fast, don't I? I'm going to have to take me some pills to where I can slow down a little bit. Do they make pills for that? At 71 years old, I'm just too, I'm too vibrant. I'm too alive. Uh, I need to be more like a real old person. My grandkids will say, I'll say, I'm getting old, and they'll say, Papa, you're not old. Canyon said to me the other day on vacation, he said, how many times have I had to tell you you are not old? That's what my 10-year-old grandson told me. He said, how many times do I have to tell you, Papa, you're not old? Jump in this pool with us. I said, I'm not jumping. I'll walk in, but I'm not jumping. I don't jump into water, not me. I don't swim, but I promised them. I'll tell you what I promised them. I promised them I'll take swimming lessons, and the next year when we go on vacation, I'll be able to swim with them. That's a promise. And I told them at the gym today, I said, I'll probably be changing my membership to the Y before long. They said, oh, why are you doing that? What are you doing? Blah, 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 blah. I said, I'm going to take swimming lessons. And so I am. I'm going to learn how to swim. You know why I never did learn how to swim, Dana? You know what? My dad said to all of us, five brothers and sisters, all the five of us, none of us can swim. He would say, don't get into the water till you learn how to swim. You'll drown. If you, if you drown, you, he said, you'll drown. And I would look at him and I said, well, how am I going to learn how to swim if I don't get in the water? And he just forgot about it. He just went on. You can? Do you charge a lot? 
Let me tell you another part of the story. We got to move on. I, I, I'm wanting to try to get done with eight if I can at all. We've been in this a long time. I'm about ready to get done with Daniel, aren't you? Oh, well, good. I'm glad to hear you say no because I thought I was over here. It was all over. It's not over till it's over. I could sing it for you. You all want me to? <laughs> Thanks for being honest. This is going on Facebook. Do you all know that? There's going to be a lot of people that's going to get some fun out of this one. They're going to get some laughs out of this one. So Sophie is my little granddaughter that's soon going to be a teenager. So she said to me, we were in the pool one day, and she said, Papa, I can teach you how to swim. I said, really? She said, yeah. I, I said, well, will you give me swimming lessons? I said, I'll pay you if you, you know. And she said, okay. I said, today will be your first lesson. She said, now get up there and sit on the edge of the pool. Put your feet down in the water. And she said, start moving your feet up and down. I said, just start moving your feet. And said, move them this way, move them this way, move them. And said, just keep doing that for a while. Well, after a while, I got tired of that, and I said, uh, can we just quit this and do something else? She said, when do you need to learn how you need to paddle your, your feet? And so I'm doing this, and then I said, well, I want to get back in the water with you all because I'm not going to stay in here forever. And she went and told her daddy that when they got in the room and stuff, and they were on the way to eat, they were in their car, of course. She said, Daddy said, I gave Papa his first swimming lesson today, and he did not pay me. <laughs> Oh, I tell you. <laughs> so the, I didn't say anything. She didn't know I knew that. So the next day I said, Sophie, you're going to give me my second lesson today? And she said, okay, Papa. She said, okay, this time, said, you've got to get in the water and you've got to hold to the side of the pool and, and you've got to let your body float and, you, and you've got to start. And then I'm not going to tell you. How, I mean, I can't show it here anyway. You can visualize it, all right? But uh, anyway... <laughs> Well, she told him that night, uh, they're on the way to eat, and she said, I gave Papa the second lesson today and said, he still didn't pay me. <laughs> oh, I'm so, I'm so, they may watch this. <laughs> I know. Your word said that you would teach us, therefore you love Oh, don't worry about it. I always take care of my grandkids. I, Listen, I've taken care of them enough to where the, I shouldn't ever have to pay them again. I'm telling you, really. But I will. I'll pay her. And I asked her, I said, what do, what do you charge a lesson? Her brother spoke up and said, $50 a lesson. So I'm in deep water, folks. How'd you like that? Deep water. I'm in deep water. Let's get back to the word. All right, prophecy. Now, prophecy has a primary meaning and a secondary meaning. Prophecy can be fulfilled totally when it's spoken or it may be a word that will not be fulfilled totally and years may develop before the final prophecy is all fulfilled. I want to give you two or three examples of that. Go to the first book of your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 3 and 15. And I want to show you, this is the first time in the Bible that you find a prophetic word from God being given and he's speaking this to Satan in Genesis 3 and 15. How many know what, what that is right off? Do you know? Okay, Genesis 3 and 15. Now, this is after Adam's sin and Eve's sin, and God has made contact with them in the garden, and he's asking them why they've done what they've done and so on and so forth. And uh, verse 13, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. Now, uh, he asked Adam, he said, uh, you know, when they heard the voice of the Lord, they heard him coming and he's calling their name. Uh, they hide themselves among the trees of the garden. And uh, the Lord called, the Lord God, this is Jehovah Adonai, uh, he calls to Adam and he says, where art thou? Uh, I shouldn't have said Adonai, it's Jehovah Elohim. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, I was afraid. Because I was naked, the Lord said, well, who told you you were naked and all this kind of stuff. And there's a lot of stuff here that we could talk about, but we're not doing that per se. So the Lord goes down in verse 14. He says to the serpent, who is Satan himself, that's one of his names, the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. And from this point on, Satan is no longer 
going to be an upright being with the, with the communication ability to speak. Did you know the devil could talk? And he did to Eve in his serpentine form. He was a beautiful being, a beautiful creature. Isaiah tells us that and Ezekiel tells us that. That he, he was, do you know that the devil had every stone as a covering like was on the breast pray, a plate of the, the priest, the high priest? Read in your Bible in Ezekiel chapter, it's Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel, some, uh, it's, it skipped me. It'll come back to me here in a minute. My brain's on partially on hold right now. Have you all noticed that? Don't say amen. But he says to the serpent, and he said, Upon thy belly shalt thou go. From this point, the devil's going to be like a snake. He's going to be a serpent, and he's going to be on his belly, and he's going to be eating dust all the days of his life. And then notice 15. He said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between the Satan and the woman. And here's a very important part of this prophetic utterance. Between thy seed, the seed of serpent, and the seed of the woman. The only problem being her seed is impossible, humanly speaking. A woman does not have any seed. A woman only has an egg. She doesn't have the seed. A man has to fertilize the seed, the egg with his seed. Okay, for Jesus to come into the world as the Son of God, being the Son of God that he is, there had to be a woman bring forth a child without the aid of a human father because the, the, the bloodline of Adam in his sinfulness is passed on from generation to generation to generation. And by the time it got over here to the book of Luke, the Holy Spirit had to overshadow Mary with his presence for her to be impregnated and bring forth the Son of God. That's called the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus is not virgin born, he can't be God and is not God because he would have the tainted human sin that in his bloodline that we have. See, there's no man on this earth who can forgive your sins. I don't care if you go inside a confessional booth and tell the Holy Father everything you've ever done in your life. He can't forgive you because his bloodline, his blood is tainted with sin just like yours is. There's only one person who can forgive sins on the earth and that was Jesus Christ in human form when he was here, but he's God at the right hand of the Father, right hand of his Father, sets our great high priest, and he forgives our sins when we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to cleanse us, forgive us of all unrighteousness. Only he, there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Are you with me? So this promise right here, now look, the first part of this prophetic word was fulfilled immediately. The devil became the serpent on his belly going around like as a snake. But the last part, enmity between thy seed and her seed, it, her seed, that's Jesus, shall bruise thy head, the devil, and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's talking about the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and more than that, he's talking about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, in that prophetic utterance, I can't keep up. Hey, does any, will somebody bring me a string? Let's put a hole through this thing. Hang it right here around my neck. So, I, Okay, let's, let's erase yum. I'd rather have yum, wouldn't you? Yummy, yummy, instead of yummy, yummy. Okay, look here. The first part of that prophecy is what? The curse. The last part of that prophecy is the cross. How many years transpired between the first fulfillment of the curse part and the last fulfillment of the cross part? 4,000 years. Between Genesis 3.15 and the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, at the time they're given, some are partially fulfilled. It's called a fragmented fulfillment of that prophecy, a fragmented fulfillment. Now, it, there could be centuries, even thousands, millennia of years. Uh, Isaiah 9 and 6, let's look at that. I'm going to hurry. We're not going to get out of 8 today. Is that going to bother you? Just hang on to your chart I gave you. Isaiah 9 and 6, 
Well, you're getting the Word of God, folks. You're getting a lot of stuff that you're not going to get otherwise. Yes, you are right. Ezekiel 28, you're right. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate your help. Now let's go to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Right here is a, a prophecy that is a... Uh, this is known as a compound prophecy. It's more than one thing mentioned in it that has to be fulfilled. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 is called a compound prophecy. For unto us a child is born. Now is this talking about a child in the days of, of Isaiah? Or is this a prophetic word for the future? It's what? It's a prophetic word. This is not per se some little boy that's going to be born in Isaiah's day as such. This is because you say, how do we know who it is? Well, look at his name. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Who qualifies for all of those names? There's only one person who can do that. That's Jesus Christ. So this is a compound prophecy. Now, the first part of it said a child is born. That speaks of what? His humanity. A child. He's a child. He's human. That's his human part. But then he said a son is given. That speaks of his divinity. Jesus Christ is the God-man. He's 100% God. He's not 50-50 now, but he's 100% God and 100% man with the exception of the sin principle because his blood did not carry the curse of sin. He's, he's, he's of God. He is God, incarnate in flesh. And this prophecy speaks of two different times and two different accomplishments. The first part, a child is born. That was fulfilled with his birth. That was fulfilled with his first coming. Oh my, I tell you what, we're just getting into a lot of stuff here today that's good, isn't it? Isaiah 9 and 6. This'll, this is going to build a foundation for further prophecies from Daniel here. Okay, child, I'm going to write child, is given. Oh, I'm sorry, child is born, pardon me. Thanks for your enlightenment. Okay, first coming. Son is given. Oops. This is his second coming. He was born the first time he's only going to be given the second time he's coming back in the, in, to set up his kingdom. Now, here's what he said. The government shall be upon his shoulders. Did that occur the first time? No. He would have set up a kingdom and they thought he was going to set up a kingdom, an earthly kingdom. But what did he do? They refused him as king. What did they do to the king? They killed him. They murdered him at Calvary. They crucified him. But that was all in the plan of God. Because you know what the scripture says? If they had known who he was, they would have never crucified him. That's what the Bible says. Their eyes were blinded to the fact that Jesus was who he was. We can't fuss too much about the Pharisees. Yeah, they were religious people, but they were not saved people. They, they knew, listen, they had all the, they had the prophecies of the Old Testament. And when, when, when old uh, Herod, King Herod, Antipas, that's the one who was in power when Jesus was born. There were five of those Herods, by the way. I, uh, there were five too many because they were wicked, evil, ungodly, ruthless, despos. That, do, you, do you realize that, that Herod killed his own mother? He had one of his wives. He killed one of his own sons because he thought his son was going to take the throne away from him. And when the wise men came, and there, was a bunch, and there wasn't just three wise men riding three camels, I've done a lot of research on that because I wanted. There was a bunch of them that came from the from the middle. They came from the Middle East. Uh, they probably came from a country called Persia, 
which we call Iran today. They were, there was a Jewish section there in Persia. They had copies of the written word of God, manuscripts. They studied them. And you know what they found when they read the Torah and Moses said there would be a star rise up? He not only said a star, but he said a scepter. What, what's a scepter for? It's a king holding that as power and authority. We just saw the death of a queen. She's going to be buried tomorrow. And for 70 years, she was queen of England. And the world has just, I mean, you talk about the honor they gave that woman. She was the richest woman in the world. You all realize that? Do you know she had the, the most expensive diamond in the world? She did. She had in her, in her a crown of jewels, her treasure jewels, the most expensive diamond was in her crown. And they asked her about the crown. I, I saw some of this on TV. They played clips of her life, and she said, the crown was nice to you. had to bend over. And then she said, you know, it was fastened to her head, and it hurt her when she bent over because it was so heavy. But anyway, but that's beside the point. King Herod was so paranoid that when these wise men came seeking, they said, where is he that's born king of the Jews? That was one of Herod's titles he used, king of the Jews. And so he started trying to find out some information and he went to the, to the religious leaders and they said, well, uh, the Old Testament here, that, they didn't say Old Testament because there was a, no New Testament, but we say the Old Testament. I said, well, the Bible says here, the manuscripts, the Holy Scriptures, say here that he's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. That's in the book of Micah. And so they, they realized where he was. So what did Herod do? He had all the little boy babies killed from two years old and under trying to get rid of Jesus Christ. Okay, that prophecy did not happen when this was spoken in Isaiah. The first coming, no. The, he, he would have been the king, and he was the king, but they rejected the king and killed the king, so the government was never on his shoulders at the first coming but the government will be on his shoulders the next time he comes because verse 7 said of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. There you see a compound prophecy. Part of it is fulfilled partially the first time he came. The rest of it will be fulfilled the next time he comes. And I am out of time. So these prophecies, dual prophecies, dual fulfillments, spoken sometimes thousands of years between them, so with Daniel. Here's what the Lord t told Daniel when he got done with the remainder of this chapter. If you look at verses 26 and 27, I believe, 26 and 27, he tells Daniel to shut up this book, this prophecy. Seal it, seal it up, shut it up till the time of the end. See, the reason why he told him to shut that up at that time, those people could not have received all of this because they didn't understand it. Like Daniel is the one who had received the understanding from the angel. And when he did, the Bible said it made him so sick that he fainted. And he was sick certain days. I'm in chapter 8, verse 27 and 28. Is that where I am? Somebody tell me because I've already, I've already closed my Bible. Make sure I'm at the right place. Actually, I think I quoted that from Job. Is that right? I'm joking with you. Again, Daniel chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. And the Bible said that he, it made him so sick. See, the prophecy, can, listen, the words that were spoken about this Antiochus Epiphanes, his life was lived and fulfilled those prophecies for that time that were, that were involving him. But the same word spoken about him, which we'll find next week, actually refer not just to him in an isolated event, because he lived and died, but future tense refers to the Antichrist who will come in the future. So we're going to study that next week and get into the 77s. Now, how many is excited about getting into the secret of the 77s? Yes. We're, going to have, we're going to have a good time next week, so invite your friends to come with you and your, your 
Dana, bring your boyfriend with you. We'd like to have him in class. Father, we just pray now you'll bless his time. Thank you for the time we've had this morning, and we give you praise for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.